Good evening. Welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, whether you're here in person or online, it's a, a privilege to kind of kick off this Advent season with, with all of you. Technically, Advent started uh, this past Sunday, but there's just something about the midweek Advent service that uh, like shifts a gear of, of our, our traditions. And, um, and I think this is where we really start to feel like we're stepping into something unique. And so um, it, it's, it's really pretty, pretty special to be uh, gathered with all of you tonight. Um, our service is uh, something that we haven't done in a while. And so I want to talk about a couple of components. Um, first of all, the Advent season in general is, is really a lot about light. We light more candles as we get closer to Christmas that, that kind of reminds us of the, the journeying toward the manger and the waiting for the Savior to come. And so uh, it, it seemed fitting to use this service called evening prayer, which is like the service of light. We get all this neat biblical imagery of uh, the light that comes from uh, Christ as our Savior, kind of woven throughout. And it is a very, very uh, musical service. And so I hope you're feeling a little strong in the vocal cords tonight. Um, let's, what should we look at first? Um, how about, turn to page four, please. This uh, responsively sung psalm is not something we've done in a long time. And uh, for uh, some good chunks of the service, I'm, I'm really thankful to have uh, Scott Benninghoff uh, helping out with uh, cantering upstairs. And uh, would you uh, lead us in, in a couple of these psalm verses? Let's just give this a practice. As, the, as long as the organ sings good and loud, we're ready to go, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, let's look at uh, a couple more things. Uh, how about page seven and eight? First of all, I just want to point out with this Magnificat, it kind of works like uh, this is the feast that we're a lot more familiar with where we have... Uh, verses and refrain, and so I just want to call your attention to, if you look at the end of the verses on the top of page 8, the refrain is after 2 and 5, but not all of them, so just uh, kind of be aware of that. And uh, the second thing is, I always think it's a little bit tricky uh, to do this particular uh, litany prayer uh, that we have there on verse 8, and so uh, I wanted to try out a little of that, and the, the unique characteristic of this is that uh, when I say, Lord, so do you. So we, it's not successive. We, we overlap with that one word at the end of those petitions on pages eight and nine there. Um, so uh, let's, let's try a couple of those real quick on page eight, the first, couple, first two petitions of the, the litany. In peace, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord mercy. Oh, I think we got it. Fantastic. 
All right. Uh, oh, one more thing. Can you go back to page four? I promise I won't do any more of this. At the very bottom, uh, the last part that is uh, ours or yours, uh, the top line after the C didn't get bolded, so, but that's still your part. So just, uh, just be aware of that. I think that's logical, though. And um, we're a very intelligent congregation, so I'm sure you were ahead of me there. Um, tonight, as a theme, we do what I think is a very kind of logical thing to start out uh, our season of Advent together, and that is we start at the beginning. We go uh, right back to the garden. We have the reading of the fall into sin in the first gospel promise, and we, we kind of use that as a lens to step into the position of uh, all the faithful people that have gone before us in those ages that uh, trusted God's faithfulness and trusted God's word that the Savior would come. And we, uh, we use that as a, kind of a lens to focus ourselves on the, the meaning of why he came and the, the celebration that's before us. And so um, that, that's our theme for this evening, and that's what we're going to see kind of wrapped around uh, some of our hymns as well as the readings and sermon tonight. And uh, with all of that said, I'll invite you to uh, stand as we begin this service in the Lord's name and with his blessing. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And illumine your church. Joyous light of glory.
righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over and led, then shake I hear my words, for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. But my eyes are toward you, God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge, let me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me, and from the snares of the evil do. Let us pray. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever. first reading this evening comes to us from Genesis chapters 1 and 3. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And our second reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, many more have the grace of God. And the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. In the name of Jesus, amen. I used to really love a very specific meal at a specific time of the week. I thought about the best thing that you could have after church on a Sunday was a ham sandwich and potato salad. That was what I thought was the king of all meals. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean your average any ham sandwich and potato salad. I mean hot shaved off the bone ham. I mean a hard roll, the kind where the crust is chewy and crispy and the inside is fluffy and light. I mean the potato salad, the, the German kind that's warm and made with bacon grease so it makes you feel alive while it's working to the opposite. I, <laughs> I loved those two things together after church so much. And I found uh, when I was a senior in college, there was uh, somewhat close to my apartment, there was a bakery across the street from a deli and the bakery would make these perfect rolls, and the deli was shaving the ham and making the potato salad up hot, and I could get exactly that meal just walking across the road if I could make it to both by noon. They both closed on Sunday at noon, and it was the only day they made these things, by the way. And there was one Sunday where I was driving off to the bakery in the deli, and it was a little bit difficult by the way, to get there at noon. Now, I had my trusty, rusty Jeep Wrangler, uh, which, uh, by the way, it was stick shift, so it was really fast. 
um, and it would kind of get me there with the angels and archangels almost every week. Uh, but on one Sunday in particular, I was driving down what was Maryland Avenue in Milwaukee, and uh, coming towards me in the other direction was a city bus, which is kind of normal and average. But uh, all of a sudden, on a cross street with some stop signs, there was a pickup truck, and he wanted to beat the bus. And some combination of maybe misjudging my speed because I was sandwich focused and uh, seeing the bus and wanting to race it meant that he got excited and I made different lunch plans and started driving a moped around. Now I tell you, um, some fraction of that situation was absolutely the fault of uh, my pride and not focusing on the important things in the moment. And I was, for some time, really, really captivated on the idea that I just wanted that moment back. I just wanted to do something different with it. I, like any number of scenarios, I wish I was maybe focused more on my surroundings and less on my stomach so that I could uh, slow down or swerve and get out of the way or something like that. Or maybe um, I would have left church earlier or maybe uh, I would have just gone to Jimmy John's and got a number one for one week and could have avoided all of this mess. But the one thing was very clear to me, I wanted that moment back. I knew that I had messed this up. I knew that some of it was my fault, and I just, just wanted that little sliver of time back. And I think we've all been there. I think every one of us can come up with any number of scenarios where there is a moment when we just did something and we want it back. So uh, imagine someone asks you something and it's a little uncomfortable and you just make up a quick little lie to move on and all of a sudden you're confronted with it again and you make up a bigger lie and all of a sudden you're surrounded with bigger and bigger lies about this one thing that was so simple and you just want that moment back to just get the awkwardness over with and move forward. Or maybe you're on the phone with a friend and the conversation just somehow turns kind of tense and you say some things that the next morning you knew you shouldn't have. We've all had these scenarios where we just want that moment back. I think that's a great way to think about our first reading tonight. And in this season, we're, we're going back to the beginning and that original sin and that original promise of the Savior. And I think it is absolutely fair to say that Adam and Eve, for their lives, wanted that one moment back. I bet they thought over and over at different points about how badly they wished they could have made a different choice. I bet as they were walking out the gates of the perfect home, they had ever, the only one they've ever known, they wanted that moment back. I bet the first time Adam figured out farming, he really wanted that moment back. I bet when uh, their children were born and the uncertainty of the world around them was weighing on their shoulders, I bet they wanted that moment back. When violence and even murder erupts between their sons, I bet they wanted that moment back. I bet any number of times they question, why didn't we just listen? Why didn't we follow the one rule? Why didn't we have vegetables one time? But it was too late. The damage was done. And to their credit, maybe, they did kind of try to fix it, right? They, they do the human thing. They, they pass the blame. God says, well, Adam, what's, what's going on here? He says, well, it was, it was Eve. And well, okay, Eve, what was going on here? Well, it was the serpent. And they kind of pass the blame on down. And they try their best to make this go away, but the damage is done. I know before I lost my Jeep, I had tried any number of times. I got in little fender benders and things to 
uh, fix it myself. I'd go to the junkyard, I'd figure out the bolts, I'd, I'd, I'd make it work, I, I could fix it. I couldn't fix it this time. It was, it was too much and I knew that there was nothing that I could do to make this right, to put this back together. And I think we see that too. When we consider all those moments where we just want them back, maybe when we think about that friend on the phone and saying the things that we shouldn't have said, sometimes they're just not a friend anymore and the damage is done. Sometimes when the lie spread, our reputation suffers and it can take any amount of time, maybe even never, to get it put back together. In fact, there is no example where we can reach into the brokenness of our lives and use all of our skills and all of our intellect to put it back the way it was. We just can't do it. And so God looks out on a world such as this, filled with people who are filled with regret, who lead lives full of brokenness, and what does God do? God makes a promise. Right there, at the end of our first reading, he makes a promise to send an offspring that's going to take on, defeat the devil, defeat death, defeat sin once and for all, and put things back together. But see, when God makes this promise, he doesn't simply promise it generally or generically to the offspring of Adam and Eve. He specifically uses a singular term for one member of the offspring of Eve, one. And so when Eve has her first son, she says, I have borne a man the Lord. Essentially, we have suffered long enough, and now that we have had an offspring, we can go home. This can end. But she was wrong. And so every generation on down, they looked for who is the promised offspring. And generation after generation, people looked for God to be faithful, God to keep his promise he made to a broken world. And finally, it came. That's Advent. That's where we are. We are recognizing those that have gone before us and looked for the Savior to come, and we are realizing the brokenness all over our lives and the regret that we feel that meant that he had to come. But we know we are the forgiven, the redeemed, the baptized. We know where the story goes. We know that God was faithful. And we know that we can take all of that regret and all of that brokenness And we can cast it at the foot of the cross. We can push it onto him. And in repentance, all of a sudden, something happens that we could never do ourselves. And the brokenness is fixed. And the the regret is gone. And in its place, peace. It can only come from the one that's promised. And so that is how we go back to the beginning, and that is how we start our walk forward to the manger, is we look at all the ways in which we see the the wreckage in our wake that is completely and eternally promised to be fixed and mended and perfected in recreation only through the babe at Bethlehem. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life eternal. Amen. Please stand.
Pray to the For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For Matthew, for John, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. For Donald, for all public servants, for the government of those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For Keith and for Frank, that healing would be theirs according to the good and gracious will of the Lord, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. O oh God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The, the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.